my first special guest live on Shalom TV is someone I have the highest personal regard for. I consider him a personal friend, and in many ways, I learn from him every day. And before we went on the air, we were joking with each other. We do not see together, we do not do see issues eye to eye in lockstep. There's no question that in the broad sense, the vision and the values that motivate Steve Gutto are the ones that I emulate the most. It is so wonderful to have you as my first guest. Thank it's you very, very much. Thank you for honoring me. And uh, Shana Tova, Mitukai, I hope you have a wonderful, happy new year. How were your holidays, by the way? They were lovely. Were they? I, um, you know, I moved up here seven years ago, and I began from? going to... From? St. Louis. I yes, was a pulp, and before pulp that? Rabbi. Before St. Louis, I was, um, I was in uh, rabbinical school Yes. At, uh, in Philadelphia yes. and also in, in Jerusalem. And before that, but isn't Texas in your background? Yeah, yeah. I was bred and born and raised there. It's where my, it's where my heart lives. Uh, Still, I, absolutely. I call it the other promised land. <laughs> That's lovely. It's a, it's a good okay. Thing. But this year, where were you for holidays? Where I've been for seven years is SAJ, the Society for the Advancement of Judaism, which was Mordecai Kaplan, the founder of the Reconstructionist movement, which is the movement that I'm a rabbi of. It was his synagogue in the early 1900s. Yes. And it's, a very, it's just a very, it, it's Hamish a loving place. And it is. And I feel fortunate when I walk in there. You are fortunate. To be, you understand that you and I share many connections. And one of the connections we do share is the SAJ, where I became a bar mitzvah. And my brother became a bar mitzvah. My daughter, her husband, and their, my nine-year-old grandson, their son, are members of the SAJ. She's now a big shot at the SAJ. What's her name? Sarit Golub Greenberg. Somebody? And her husband is David Greenberg. And uh, I became bar mitzvah with Mordechai Kaplan sitting right in front of me. And my no, really? Yes, That's yes, exciting. It, it was. My That's grandfather exciting. was a colleague of his and helped form the Reconstructionist Movement in the SAJ. So... Uh, can we talk about this? This, yeah. seems, this seems new to me. <laughs> yes. We have a real uh, simpatico in that regard. Anyway, it's a lovely service, and Michael now is the rabbi there. He's wonderful. He's doing a wonderful really job. Great stuff. So I'm very, very happy you had a lovely high holidays, and I hope our audience also had a wonderful new year, both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And lo and behold, I'm, I open up an email, and it's from, oh, I, I should have said, by the way, Steve is one of the foremost leaders on the American Jewish scene today. He is the president and CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, JCPA. And I never get tired, and I never want you to get tired of hearing it said, you do extraordinary work, both for the Jewish community and for the United States of America with your organization. And I was privileged to be with you for your hunger seder in Washington, which was extraordinary. But we'll talk about many of the things you do. But first of all, kol kavod to you as you begin a new year. Thank you for all the extraordinary work you do at the JCPA. Thank you for saying that. It means a lot. So I get an email from you. Yeah. And uh, I look at it. And your organization is responding to an ad that went up in the New York subway system. Right. And uh, Sloan, I wish you would put up now that ad and let me know when it's being seen. But we, we can do everything right now live. The one thing I can't do is I can't see what the viewers are seeing. But let me know when the ad is being uh, is, is out. And this is an ad that was placed by a woman named Pamela Geller, who paid for the ad. And it is an ad that reads, In any war between civilized man and the savage, support the civilized man. And then it says, Support Israel, defeat jihad. Support Israel and defeat jihad. And the JCPA put out a statement which said, the message is bigoted, divisive, and unhelpful. And it distinguishes between protected speech and good speech, suggesting that even if this ad is protected, and it did, it is protected, it is protected by the First Amendment and a court so ruled, the MTA was not going to run, allow her to put this ad up, and a court insisted that she had the right under the First Amendment to put this ad up, and then the JCPA quotes you, President Steve Guto, saying that you condemn the attack, you called for civility in how we treat each other, 
and also your JCPA chair, Larry Gold, said we should build bridges, not burn them. And my understanding from the email that you sent out was that you saw this as an anti-Muslim ad. When I saw the ad myself, before I even read your email, I said to myself, it's an ad that is pointing it to what seems to be the most significant enemy of the West and the state of Israel at the moment, not Islam as a whole, but a narrow band of Islamic extremists who have a jihad mentality and a jihad goal. And I don't understand what bothered you about putting Israel on the one hand, and not Muslims on the other hand, but jihad on the other hand. And I didn't know why you saw that as an anti-Muslim ad. And so I wanted to give you a chance to really explain it, and maybe we'll talk about it for a moment. There are other things too, but that was the first thing I was hoping to hear you speak about. I think there's a few answers, Mark, to your question. First of all, the answer is when one wants to create an, an, an ad or anything against a certain piece of a people, you need to be very careful. So if this ad was really about Muslim extremists, one, it would, it would need to, to be very clear that that's what it was about. Jihad is, it, it, jihad is actually not a Muslim extremist. Jihad is a part of the inner workings of Muslim theology. Every Muslim is supposed to go on an inner jihad, and that's actually when a Muslim sees it, that's basically what a Muslim sees about jihad. So if you were a Muslim sitting on a subway and you saw jihad, you wouldn't be thinking of people running around attacking. You'd be thinking of something since early childhood that you've cared about. And, you know, I compare it, compare it to when I remember in the 70s and then on where Zionism is racism, where people t took words that, that meant a great deal to me as a Jew and used it, bankers are Jews, and they're all against, you know, America doing this. Or it, it, it's, it's a sort of consistent thing. It could be with Christianity, you could say that the, uh, you know, that the Trinity is, is stupid. And it, it's, to a Muslim, that ad is, is, is about Islam. And to anyone who knows about Islam, that ad is about Islam, because that's what Islam really does. I mean, you know, I've learned about jihad before I learned about jihad as, as some kind of attacking mechanism by certain extremists. So that's number one. Number two is, is this really where the debate about what may or may not need to happen within Islam to make sure it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's governments that, that are part, that are Islamic or its church, its mosques stand up to some of the violence they see? I don't think so. I'm sorry, say it again. Is this really the place? Is this the venue for a debate? And I think there is a discussion. D does, do the mosque, does the, does the Islamic mainstream stand up strongly enough against violent attacks or against, ex, you know, or against comments about You're violence. asking that question. I'm asking you that question. I th would think that an ad on a subway is probably calling jihad, which to most, much Muslims is me. If I'm a Muslim looking at the word jihad, I think of me. Not me attacking Jews. I think of me trying to be a good Muslim, trying to see the inner self. And I'm called a savage. I'm called a savage because of that. It, it just isn't the right venue for the debate. I mean, there is a discussion that needs to be had. Does Islam stand up strongly enough to some of its extremist elements? And, you know, I think one could be on either side, or if it's trying to, or if it's doing the right job. I mean, certainly, when you look at the Islamic world today, one wonders, with its response to that recent video, the Coptic Christian, it looks like a Coptic Christian, we don't know for sure, but the, the, the horrific video, it was a horrific video, but the response was more horrific. And the violence that has you know, come all over the, the Muslim world is more horrific. These are real questions. The place to answer those questions is, is not on an ad on a subway calling Muslims to, to their face in, in their view, and in my view, savage. It would be like calling all Zionists racist. I mean, it's, it's, it's wrong. And the reason we were so strong about that ad is because we, we are Jews, and we understand when people take something, twist it, and just put it up there like a one-word thing, not, not a conversation. And we, you know, we respect study. We respect the fact that we as a people need to really investigate and think. And I add a third part. We're in a time in the world and in America 
where Islam is facing some of the same challenges, we know the bulk of the seven million Muslims, or four million, depending on which survey, are basically good people, basically good Americans, just like basically Jews are and Christians are. And to, to put them through, at this time, when Islamophobia, which is the word of the day, when that is so strong, and not for Jews to stand up for it, we know. I and mean, you know, when Martin Niemöller said, first they came after the Jews and I didn't stand up, I'm not gonna be the one that says, first they came after the Muslims and I didn't stand up. I think it's time for us to stand up. And when we see ads like that, to say, of course it's protected. The First Amendment means a lot to us as a, as a, as a country and as a people within that country as, as Americans and as Jews. But of course it's protected speech, but it doesn't mean it's okay speech. It doesn't mean it's mm -hmm. good speech. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't mind continuing the discussion, but I, I feel very strongly that this is not a helpful ad. It's not, it's not furthering a debate. It's, it's an attack ad on a whole people. It, okay. I'll stop. First of all, wonderful. You said it beautifully. And you can always convince me. That's very, very beautiful. I don't think that's true. <laughs> but if I did a little bit on this, I'll be happy. Okay. Um, the most important thing you said, I believe, and I hope everybody heard you, was that to the world of Islam, everyone is a jihadist. Mm -hmm. In the popular usage of that term in America, the word jihad means something totally different. I, that doesn't make it right. What I mean by that is, the popular understanding of the word jihad may be a misunderstanding of what the word means to the people who created the word. I'm not sure, that I, I'll be happy to go into whether there's an analogy with the word Zionist. People who said Zionism is racism really believed it, but they also didn't understand what it is to be a Jew. Now, and Jews do call themselves Zionists, the most important new thing you've added in this discussion for me is that the average Islamic individual believes in jihad. Now I want to understand whether the notion of jihad that we are fed by the general media, even by our government, is it true or not? Is jihad a philosophy that says the only legitimate government in the world is an Islamic government, and that in some way, whether it's violent or nonviolent, there is a responsibility of the jihadist to ultimately supplant any non-Muslim government. And if it isn't, I want you to tell me what jihad does mean. Jihad is a, jihad means in Islamic theology, it's a, it's a search for yourself. It's an internal investigation so that you can be as close to your, to your view of what God is as, as you can be. Then why it's is it related in general, in general parlance? Why is it normally related to some acts of violence? And why, are, why, why is there a distinction made in our own culture when we talk about Muslims in general or jihadists? First of all, I think you may, and I'm not, I'm not being critical, I'm just being honest, I think you may live in a, in a narrow culture. We all do live in our own worlds and our own areas of, of the world. And I don't think most people in America even know what jihad is. But I do think they kind of know it's Muslim. And so I, I don't want to, I don't want to, let me finish. You think I don't, the let United me, let States me, let me government finish, does let me not use the term jihadists to refer to terrorists? I think the United States government refers to the term sometimes when it's talking about organizations that call themselves jihad, just like some organizations that call themselves Zionist could be so right-wing and radical uh, on one issue or another that some of us might not feel comfortable in them. It doesn't give, it doesn't give anyone the right to take my word away, and it doesn't give me the right to take the word jihad away from a Muslim where it's a basic premise. And to ask me a question like you just asked, it would be so easy. I have too many friends who see Zionism as the worst thing that ever happened to the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. And they Absolutely. don't have any idea what it is. I mean, you know, I have to explain it to I even have friends that are Jewish that don't understand what Zionism <laughs> is. And so I am not going to take, I'm not going to jump over and become a, you know, a, an anti-jihad 
Jew, because, because I, I mean, I, 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 I understand. I'm not going to do that. And I don't really think, I was watching um, w w here with one of your colleagues, I was watching a, a video on some of the people's view of the ads. These were mostly probably looking at them, Christians. And all of them thought that it was wrong and that it was about Muslims. So unlike those of us that live in this kind of world where we talk politics all the time, people said, you know, it, 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 people that support Israel are civilized. People that are Muslims, that's actually what the people on this, uh, on this video said on the, on the computer, are, um, are savages. That's too bad. This is not that'd, that'd something. Terrible. So if by its definition, Mark, I, I, I say this, if by its definition, if it leaves this impression, if it's not contributing to any major debate, why would any of us want this to be an ad on a subway? I'm not, again, I'm, I said it before, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the conversation about Islam. That's a fine conversation. Tom Friedman's written two great columns in the last couple of weeks in the New York Times. But we don't need to, we don't need to be the bigots that we really don't want in our own lives. We I don't understand. need to become those people. If the word jihad is a synonym in people's minds for Islam, then the ad is absolutely unacceptable. When I read the ad, my understanding of what a jihad referred to was not the way you defined it. And I don't, and I'm not sure what your comment about what world I live in is. If in fact, the government of the United States has made a distinction between Islamists in general and jihadists in particular, then it certainly is something that people all over the United States could be exposed to and in my mind, should be exposed to. Your main, the reason I find validity to your approach and, sen and it sensitizes us is that what you're saying is to the Islamic mind, the word jihad is a synonym for Islam. Correct? Part of Islamic, it's part of the Islamic journey. Yes, it's part of the Islamic journey to, to, to being a good Muslim, to, to caring about God. Okay. How do you define those who would be, what I understand, a very small percentage of the Muslim world who do, we call them extremists, and who do want to overthrow Western civilization. Extremist. That's the answer. Yes, extremist, terrorist. I mean, there, there are a lot of names that serve it. it. I still don't think it belongs on a billboard. Why not? I don't think it does anything for the world. I think, it's, I think it really does feed into this this need of many people to be bigoted and hateful towards people. And like I said, the people of, the people of choice now to hate are called Muslims. Uh, they used to be Jews. So I don't, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it does anything. Like I don't, I don't quite get it. And if it's going to feed into hate or if it's going to make people feel uncomfortable, why, why put it on a, let me just say this one last time, why put it on a subway billboard? Conversations in, in, the, in, a, in a debate and discussion, obviously. A subway billboard? Please. Uh. But my, my guess is that this Pamela Greer and people who empathize or sympathize with her perspective feel we are in a very, very serious war and that there is an enemy. And what they were saying was Israel is one of the strongest defenders in a war that we are in, and that at a time when the Pamela Greers feel, there is also an assault on Israel. It's saying, if you are against the enemy that is attacking the United States, that is killing a United States ambassador in Benghazi, don't mistake that for the fact that the same target is the state of Israel, and that what you want to do is you want to support the state of Israel and you want to be against whoever it is that really tries to undermine the safety and security of the state of Israel and the safety and the security of Western civilization represented by America. Benign view of Pamela Geller, I think. And um, I don't, but I, I don't think that's actually the intent of the ad. And I think there are Why? a lot. Why? Because I think that she has, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to quote because I don't have it in front of me. Uh -huh. There is an entire number of people in America that are very deeply upset about the notion of Islam. They could, a third of the people, the, a third of the, of, a, of, of the people that are on the right think of Obama as a Muslim. They actually think it. 
you know, polls show it. It's not something. You really think so? I really think they say it. I'm not, I'm not any smarter than they are when they say what they're thinking. I can't tell them what they're thinking. That's what they're telling us they're thinking. Um, you know, Islam is a, is, a, is, is a disfavored religion. I don't think this is a time to be light or, or to try to, do they have the right to do it? Absolutely. And as I Voltaire would, said, that's I'll not what we're arguing no, here. No, but I, I just don't think this is, this is like, a, this is not something that I think, I think it's clear what it's doing. All right, let me, let me ask you something. Incidentally, her name is Geller. I said Greer. It's Pamela Geller. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> Just a minute. If in World War II there had been a poster up that said, support Israel, defeat Nazism, or defeat Nazis, would you feel that that was similarly an inappropriate thing to put in the subway? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, I want to explain to me the difference. Because I believe that's all this was. That in, at the moment, there are people who, to the extent to, and we agree 100% here, Steve, to the extent to which this is anti-Muslim, it has no place on the American scene at all. But to the extent to which the expression was the exact same thing that people felt about Nazis, but in fact, she limited it in her own mind when she put this ad up to what she thought was a specific, violent, militant, extremist subgroup of the Islamic people, and that she sees them as an enemy no different than you and I would have seen Nazis. Why does it offend you, but a, a similar ad in the subway, support Israel and defeat Nazism, wouldn't offend you? Several reasons. I don't think people seeing Nazi, to, at least in today's world, would, would immediately assume all Germans everywhere. World War II? By the way, maybe, today, maybe, oh, you, that, and I know, wait, you and I know Jews right now, right now, who basically blame every German. And still, there's, in our generation, not so much in the younger generation. In our generation, they won't buy a Mercedes, they wouldn't buy a Volkswagen, they wouldn't, wouldn't visit Germany. They would have nothing to do with the fact that Germany is now a different place, even though there was this, again, every now and then you see the neo-Nazi rises head in Germany. But there are many people our age who absolutely generalized the entire German people based on who the Nazis were. Several things. One is, I'm not, I can't fall into, it, it feels almost like you're, you want to move this from the world we live in to some other world. And I don't really want to go there. We're in a world, and I'm going to say it as clearly as I know how again, we're in a world where Muslims are really genuinely attacked, are genuinely feeling fear, the same fear we Jews felt. It's clear. It's unambiguous. The polls show it. You know, mosques are burnt. People are, are stabbed in New York ta taxi cabs. This is not, this is not news. Okay, this is, this is some Preacher in Florida is burning Korans and, and, and putting out terrible, supporting terrible videos. I mean, so number one, we're living in a world where people are so antagonistic to Muslims that we as Jews, we need to know that we need to stand up. Whether Pamela Geller or what, what is in her head or not does not have anything to do with whether or not this kind of ad mm -hmm. is reprehensible. Whether or not she thought it was a good thing, whether or not she knew that most people that were Muslim were going to see it as really painful and frightening, and whether or not she knew that most people seeing the ad are going to think of it as anti-Muslim, because there's two, two different groups. I mean, there's the people like uh, the subway responders to the, to the video, and there's also the people that are Muslim that are all sitting there saying, why is she attacking my Zionism? Why is she attacking my Zionism? So it's not whether Pamela Geller what she thought. She can think what she wants, and that's part of the reason. I mean, it, it's part of the reason. It's, it's, it, it, it definitely fits under free speech. It I definitely, but no, I, I don't think it's about what she thinks, and I don't think it's about Nazism. I think it's about Islam in 2012 in the United States of America. Subway ads just aren't the way to do it. Jihad is not the word to use, and savage is not a word that should be paralleled. I don't know that, you know, I can convince you to agree with me, and I don't know that I can convince the viewers to agree with me, but I would hope that some would. I mean, I'm just hoping. By the way, you say it beautifully, and I think the most important thing you keep saying is, and, I'm, and it's not about convincing, I just think you're right, that if the, if the word jihad has a different meaning to the Muslim, you can't use it. And understand if one 
and when I started the discussion, my own understanding of what the word jihad meant was very different. It was much more circumspect, circumspect, limited, and applied only to those who would kill an ambassador to, from the United States in Benghazi. If, in fact, it has the same resonance within the Muslim world that the word Zionist has for a Jew, then I understand exactly why you were upset about it, and it upsets me too, and I think it was inappropriate to put up on the subway. And the, it's more than that. I, I think language, and, and this is something you and I have talked about before, language is very important. And it can motivate, it can both inspire, and it also can radicalize. And so our language is very, very important. I do believe I, that we are in a war with somebody. I believe that there are people who really believe the state of Israel has no right to be, no matter what it does. Its existence in and of itself has no right to be. And in part, there is a fundamentalist, extremist, Muslim ideology which would see the state of Israel no longer obliterate, just obliterate it. I, I, I agree. And as you well know, that one of the, probably the most, the thing that takes most of the JCPA's time and energy and resources is fighting Israel's delegitimization. Is may, I mean, we, we spend a lot of our time really making sure all over America and Canada, we, we do this in a partnership with the Jewish Federations of North America under something called the Israel Action Network. And it's, 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 it is certainly the thing we spend the most time on, more than we spend time uh, fighting for a civil world, fighting against in poverty in America, fighting for Sudan, the, the, fighting for the Sudanese to have a, a life. The most time, by a long shot, is, uh, is working on stopping Israel's delegitimization. Yes, and sir. I would say <coughs> that the people we fight the hardest to make sure we keep, and we do, are those people who would look at a Jewish community that would, would support hatred against Muslims or, or, or seem to and not stand up to it. They would look at that community and it would cause them to raise questions about their support of Israel. So even on that pragmatic view, we, don't want, we do not want to be out there, we JCPA, the work we do, seen as people that are antagonistic to Islam in general. And if that's the perception of what people and Muslims are gonna think, I don't want to, do, I want to stand up against that. Good for you, good that's for it. you. That's the best I can do. Good for you. We're talking with Steve Gutto. We're going to put our foot, phone number up again if you want to take part in this conversation or you just want to you know, chime in with any thoughts at all. Tell Steve just how yell wonderful. at me. No, <laughs> tell you how wonderful you are. I'd like that. Please do so. We're going to take a very quick break, and then I have some other questions I'd love to talk to Steve about. And so uh, take the phone number down. Call if you'd like. It is thrilling to be coming to you live on Shalom TV. We'll be back in just one moment. Shalom TV, television worth watching for the entire family. With the best in entertainment, culture, movies, Jewish studies, children's programs, news, events, and interviews. Shalom TV, television really worth watching. We're back with Steve Gutto. Again, we're going to put our phone number up on the screen. And, you know, for one moment, I want to talk about uh, events you're having yourself. JCPA is having, it's a sort of a board meeting, but it's open to everybody, yes? We've always kept our board meetings open. That's because wonderful. We, we want people to have to be able to be a part of them. And sometimes people come from other organizations on the left and on the right to, to debate issues with us. I mean, they have... They have a place where they can debate, and there's a place where, you know, where the only members can. Yeah, sure. Anyway, I want to put up what is uh, an event that the JCP is, a JCPA is having at the UGA Federation of New York. So take the phone number down for a moment, please, Sloan, and put up the um, barker that shows an agenda for a lovely, it's actually two days, but I think only one day, Professor Gilbert Kahn of Kane University will be speaking. What are you calling this event, by the way? We're calling... There you see it on the screen. Event. Armageddon or Business as Usual? Who came up with that title? I did. And what, what, what were you finding? What was it, what is it there, about? There are many, many people who, you know, because we're 
such a polarized society. Yes. The result of this election is the end of the world. End of the world. Off, off to Canada. <laughs> Whichever side wins, off to Canada. And so the, the, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think the changes are that dramatic. But I think the question is, here's a, here's a very bright man that really studies what this the impact of this on the American Jewish community. And I thought it would be interesting to say, let's learn what's really at stake in this election. It's just before the election. Yes, I know. Uh, so it's... Um, that's what it Very is. Very exciting for you. And yeah. I don't think it's business as usual, and I don't think it's Armageddon, but in, the, in that tension between you know, two sides, the end of the world and just the normal, <laughs> I think it's is, 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 is fodder for a great discussion. Yes, so, and Gil Khan is going to be there, yes. and we had him on Shalom TV, and he is very, very good, so it's wonderful that you're having him on. And uh, Sloan, put, up, put it up one more time, uh, and I just want to make sure everybody sees the dates and it's at the UGA Federation, which is on 59th Street, and that's where the offices will. Be. That's where the conference will be held. And uh, there you see Gil Khan, Kane University. And if you want more information, you can visit the JCPA website, jcpa.org, Jewish Council for Public Affairs. And if you get a chance, October 28th, and then Gil speaks on the 29th. And it's just, it's, it will be undoubtedly a fascinating evening. Incidentally, I'm also hosting a debate that we're going to have on Shalom TV. We may even have a, a slide with that. We're going to be doing it at B'nai Zion. Mm. Uh, and a Democrat and Republican are going to come and talk about why they believe the undecided should lean one way or the other. You know, most, put it up on the screen. We'll just show that as well. That's going to be on October 11th at the B'nai Zion House on East 39th Street. Ken Bob is the Democrat. Philip Rosen is the Republican. And I invite anybody who'd like to be there live to join us at 6 p.m. It's the same night of the vice presidential debate later that night at 9 p.m. You'll be home in time for that. But isn't it now true that... Uh, You've seen many elections, and and they they tend to be contentious anyway. But there is something about this one that has a mean spirit to it that may be may be meaner than you and I have experienced in the past. And I wonder, just you know, one of the things that I hope people know is that you've spoken out for civility in discussion, both in America as a whole and within the Jewish community. What's your sense? I'm not asking you who you're favoring, who you're voting for. I'm asking you how you how you feel the, the tone of the campaign on both sides. What's it been like, and and you know what pleases you, what displeases you? I think it's been awful. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I think it's displeasing. Um, you know, I think neither side has any interest in listening to the other. Isn't that true? I think they're fighting for this narrow swath in the middle that uh, you know that will go either way and God knows God knows if you're in the middle right now whether or not you're really thinking deeply or you just don't care that much right. and um, I worry about our country but I don't think it's Armageddon right mm -hmm. um, I talked to you about something else that just happened really during the high holidays again high holidays and, and as we're meeting there are a series of world leaders who go to the United Nations and they talk about different things. Abbas talks about what he wants to talk about. Obama talks about what he wants to talk about. And Netanyahu talks about what he, want to talk, what he wants to talk about. And lo and behold, he talks about the red line. And he actually brings a, a drawing to the podium of the United Nations and draws a red line where a picture of a bomb where he basically is saying that if a certain amount of uranium is enriched in a certain way, at that point, Iran is capable of a nuclear weapon. The JCPA did have some strong things to say about the fact that Ahmadinejad also spoke at the United Nations. But I'd love to know your reaction, A, to Ahmadinejad's coming to the UN, and what was your reaction when Benjamin Netanyahu finally said, here is the green line, and we wish the Western world and the United States would make a declarative statement to Iran that you can't go beyond this red line? Well, to, to answer your first, the first part of the question about Ahmadinejad, uh, I think he, he did his usual spewing of hate. It's almost a farce, except that he's a farce with power. It's a, you know, he's an outrageous leader, 
and his comments are outrageous, and um, it saddens me, actually, that, he is, that the Iranian people are either by their own desire or forced to They're have this victimized. person as a leader. They are victimized. It makes, it makes me sad. And, 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 and his leaders, you know, the, the mullahs, are equally, equally bad. I mean, he's, he's not a figure all by himself. He just is better at presenting what they really think. And it's, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a world tragedy. And in the context of free speech, can the United States or the United Nations deny him a platform? No. No, I agree with you. No. Um, and your other question was about Netanyahu, his red line. Yeah, red line. What do you think? I think, you know, I think it's a very serious problem. The, uh, Iran was there anything in inappropriate about saying there should be a red line? No. There's nothing inappropriate about saying there's a red line. Uh, there should be a red line. Not at all. And do you sort of like the way he defined the red line? Um, I think it makes sense. I mean, I think they're probably, it's one of those issues where they're going, there's, there's clearly a red line. There's going to be a debate about exactly where it is. I think his was rational and sensible. Um, I don't think, I think it's a complicated, it's a complicated subject. Is where is this actual red line? You know, I thought it was a, it was a good speech, a respectable speech. I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't know where the red line is. I'm not smart enough, but I, I don't, I'm not wise enough. But, um, you know, I thought it was a good speech, and I thought he made his case very well. I did, too. I agree 100% with you. It's a little surprise. People may be surprised to hear you say what you say, only for the following reason. And, I, and I'm so glad you get now to defend yourself or explain yourself. There are some in the Jewish community who would say, Steve Guto is on the left. He's on the, he's on the liberal end of the Jewish continuum. And people who are liberal in the Jewish community tend to see Netanyahu in a negative light. And therefore, they may not have anticipated Steve Guto saying something nice about a Benjamin Netanyahu speech. Do you have any comment to that? I've said a lot of nice things about <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu, and uh, you know, that's number one. And I think he's done some pretty good things. I think he's done things that I feel less positive about over the years. But I think he's, you know, he's certainly the leader of his time. It's a uh, I think the things he says generally are make a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, and there's times when I'm very thrilled by the things he says, and there's times where I have, would have more questions. Um, I don't believe that an organization that reflects the whole of Jewish life has any business attacking an Israeli prime minister ever. So that's just not what a JCPA is going to do. Mm -hmm. It's not what I'm going to do mm -hmm. in, in this job anyway. Mm -hmm. And I would hope no future CEO of this organization would do that. You have actually sat in a room with Mahmoud Abbas, have you not? No. How about with... Um, Salam Fayyad? Yes, Salam Many Fayyad. times. Okay. And why not Abbas? I've either not been in town, like I, when I could have. Um, he was not in Ramallah when I would be visiting with Fayyad. It isn't something I wouldn't do. Okay, so it wasn't, it wasn't for political reasons. I, it was I, just I, sort I of accidental? Think, I do think there was one... Really? Would he avoid meeting with Steve Guto? No. By the way, I should have said to people, although you are the head of the JCPA, you are a rabbi. You are not right now a practicing rabbi, but you are you certainly represent I'm the not Jewish a pulpit rabbi. A pulpit rabbi. I do practice my rabbinic training. I, and yeah, everything how do you I do, do that? I do it in the way I talk to people, in the way I live, and the how you're a you know, Jew. You're a good, lovely human being, Jew. Well, thank you. Thank thank you. you. Okay, anyway. I do uh, a lot of weddings. <laughs> oh, do you really? <laughs> I do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Dry shout. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you teach all the time. So I was, what I really was asking was, did Abbas not meet with you because you're a rabbi or because you're with the JCPA? I don't think Abbas ever did not meet with us because of, uh, I just think he wasn't in town. At least that's what we were told. And, okay. I, and I, I have no reason to actually question it. And I think there may have been one time where the tension between, we were there, the tension between Israel and the PA caused us not to want to meet with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may have been so this time if I had been in town. But I was, I was in Chicago. So okay. but, you know. What's your view of him these days? You know, I think he's the... First of all, I think to begin with, he's the best shot the Palestinians offer to negotiate a, any kind of peace treaty. 
he's got the most power. He's clearly the person that seems to be the most moderate. Not his speech, not his speech, but in, in, a, in a general sense. I think he's, he feels to me not as strong as he once was. He feels like, you know, it feels like he's, I know his popularity has gone down among the, in the polls and surveys, I think, of the Palestinian people. You know, but that's, it's true of American politicians, it's true of Netanyahu, it's true of, so, you know, he, he's still the head of the PA, it's still the, the only game in town that makes any sense to talk to, and I think that, you know, we as Jews, we, we as Jews, we as people that love Israel, are, are one of our goals has to be to pursue peace. I mean, Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof is, you know, it's, it's pretty bottom line. Um, so I think, I think, you know, he's, he's someone I, you know, would talk to and would work with, and uh, I have a, a deep feeling for the Prime Minister, Salam Fayyad. I, I think he's a pretty special guy, and I wish there were more people like him in the Palestinian world that I knew of. But I don't, I don't have that kind of feeling nor that kind of, you know, mis in that knowledge of, of um, the president of Abbas. At the moment, Steve, as we enter a new Jewish year, are you, do you see anything on the horizon which gives you optimism that there can be something worked out between Israel and the Palestinians? Maybe just little flares of light. Not much. Not much. I mean, I'm not. I'm not hopeful. That's not true. I'm always hopeful, but my rational self tells me it's not so likely. Isn't that sad? It is sad. We're in a sad moment. We're in a sad in moment. The, you know? in, in general, right? In so many ways, but that's certainly one of them. And you know, I've argued on Shalom TV many, many times that the Jewish world ever since the middle 30s, late 30s, has always said, we will share the land. I believe we've said it because it's the right thing to do. There are two people in this land who each have an incredible tie to it, see a certain kind of national aspiration there, and the only fair thing to do is to share it. I also believe that the Jewish community formally has been willing to share it since the 30s, they were willing to share it in 47 and in 48. And even after the Six Day War, there was a real effort to see if there was a way for Israel to give up conquered territories, occupied territories, liberated territories. Different times, the different adjectives have been used. And from the Israeli perspective and the Jewish perspective, the initiative has never been reciprocal. And as a result, I still believe that, there, that this is the Jewish, the Jewish goal. The Jewish goal is still in some way to share this land. The, way it, the, the expression now is the two-state solution. And only lately have I heard more and more people say to me, sadly, they believe the two-state solution is no longer possible and that some different form of one-state solution is going to be necessary. And you say... I say that I understand the, the sadness that moves people in that direction. And, you know, generally, it's been people on the far right and the far left who have believed in a one-state solution, which always interests me. I'd love to get them all in a room, and then they could do whatever they do. Right. But uh, with that said, I, I, I don't really see anything else to pursue. I mean, certainly, you know, certainly there's no question Israel supports a two-state solution. They've said it clearly. Um, and I, you know, I just have this hope that either because of of idealism, because of hope, because of frustration, the Palestinian Authority will also sit down and have this conversation. It's not easy for them. I mean, you know, they've got Hamas biting at them, even if they wanted to, and I don't know that they, they do. I've always had these concerns, uh, you know, because it's true. Israel has, has made a lot of offers, major offers, and offers that at least should have resulted in sitting down and if, you did, if, if Israel didn't get exactly what Barack offered, um, if, if or Omerit offered, at least it would have been a it should have been a conversation, and those conversations didn't happen. But they need to happen, and they could happen. And I, I guess that's where I go. You know, you look at the world, and, and, and see, people, things get to the worst moment, and then an eruption happens, and and um, someone goes to, and Sadat goes to Egypt. You know, it's 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 like goes to Israel. It's it's like perhaps when things get worse, at the very low low point, we're going to have some explosion of goodwill. And I want to say this: every survey I ever see of the Palestinian people and the Israeli people. They actually show huge majorities supporting two states. Huge majorities. I mean, the Israelis no longer believe it's likely. 
I, the Palestinians are up, more upset with Israel than they used to be. But the huge majority, 65, 70, you've seen the same, same, same polls, same numbers, decent pollsters. I, you know, that gives me hope. I like it. And we're Jews. We okay. have to have hope. One more topic that I very am glad to have you here to talk about. If there's been one overarching theme in America that has motivated JCPA, it's fighting poverty in this country, poverty and hunger. And we have some statistics that, again, come from the JCPA. I want to put them up on the screen for our viewers. Um, the JCPA writes that earlier this month, the U.S. Census Bureau and the Department of Agriculture released reports that showed a large number of Americans still struggling with hunger and poverty on a daily basis. Do we have those figures to put up on the screen? Okay. And this is from a report from the September 5th Department of Agriculture that shows that 46.2 million people, or roughly 15% of the American population in the United States, still live in poverty. We're in poverty in 2011. And that the official poverty level for a family of four in 2011 was $23,000. If you made more than $23,021, you were no longer officially poor in this company, a country, and you had a family of four. It is almost inconceivable that a family of four could live on $23,021 a year. Talk to me for a moment about how you view the issue of poverty in America. Again, same kind of question. What gives you hope and what frustrates you the most and what do you hope the JCPA can do? What makes me sad, before I say what gives me hope, is that we are the richest country in the world. We're a powerful country. We, we, there's no excuse for poverty to be extant in this country. I mean, there'll be some people that will always be poor. It says so. And it also says that in Deuteronomy. It doesn't just say we pursue justice. It says there'll always be poor. It doesn't support. say there will always be poor. It says. It says there will always be needy among you. It starts out by saying there shall be no needy among you. Yes. And, and, and then all of a sudden, near the end of it, like six verses later, I think it's one of the most interesting things that God says. God talking. God then says, but there shall always be needy among you. So I... I, I, and you always have to take care of them. And you always have to be nice and open-hearted and, and treat them well. But uh, So, so it, it's a very sad thing that this country allows that to happen. It's a very sad thing that there are certain policies that can really help ameliorate it that actually are very helpful even to our economy, something like the food stamp, uh, the food stamp stipends, which are, you know, really actually go right back into the economy within seconds. There's nothing else one can do with a food stamp, you know, with a, with a food stamp uh, stipend. You just use it or you lose it, and you're going to use it very fast because you have to eat. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's number one. And I don't think the country pays enough attention to poverty. I don't think the country looks at poverty. You just have to walk the streets. You know, if you're in New York, you know three, four years ago, you barely ever saw anybody. Now you walk the street and people are everywhere. They're sitting there and they're, they're it's not that they, they don't want to work. There's just not jobs for them to work at. There's not a place for them to go. And I don't know that how we as a country can watch that and not rise up and say no. And I don't know that we as a people who really have had a, a deep commitment and, and not just about Jews, even in the Torah, you know, where the one thing that separated us from the other civilizations that were at the same time, we talked about the stranger. You're, you're not only supposed to take care of the stranger, the stranger was entitled to literally everything the Jewish poor were entitled to, which was a great deal. I'm, I'm like studying a Mishnah tractate payout where we're talking about that with my Hebruta um, right now. But, every, but we had to love the stranger as ourselves. I mean, you know, that's a powerful word. So when you have to love somebody as yourself. So when I see people like that, you know, part of me wants to, to walk a little bit in their shoes, and I tried a few times. Most of me, though, wants to say that we as a Jewish people, we've been pretty good leaders on a lot of issues. We need to stand up and say, well, it doesn't matter about your politics. We have to find a way to make sure that these people do not sit and suffer that way. Their children don't suffer that way. Their parents don't suffer that way. So that gives me hope. Passion gives me hope. When mm -hmm. I get passionate and doing something, you know, I think if everybody gets passionate together, you know, we Americans can do anything, and we Jews are pretty good people to help ignite that spark. And I... 
so that's hopeful to me, and that's why JCPA and the Jewish people in general tend to be very supportive. It doesn't matter, by the way, politically whether they're right or left. I, I've been in rooms where somebody will say, I'm, I'm a Republican and I can't, and then I'll start talking to them about hunger. And they'll say, well, no, we got to do that. Of course we should do that one. You know, it's just these other things we shouldn't do. So I, I have hope about our people and I have hope about our country, but God knows. And the 46 million, by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a growth. It was one of the few times in a while that the number hasn't grown. It's sort of stayed the same. Mm -hmm. That was a good thing. Anyway. Um, incidentally, I don't know if we have a slide for this or not, Sloan. Um, in 2011, unemployment insurance benefits... Okay, put it up on the screen for me. This is lovely. Yeah, here we go. Um, look at this? this, again, is from the report published by the JCPA, a wonderful organization. Really, go to their website if you haven't. JCPA.org. Become familiar with the incredible work they do, and they do conventions every year. We've been honored to cover them and bring them to you on Shalom TV. Anyway, in 2011, unemployment insurance benefits lifted 2.3 million people out of poverty, poverty, and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, which again is what Steve meant when he mentioned food stamps, lifted 3.9 million people out of poverty, and the Earned Income Tax Credit lifted 5.7 million people out of poverty. And the reason why, Steve, this, these kind of statistics mean something to me, and I hope we as a Jewish community and as an American community take them seriously, is that, and again, I do not want this to right now degenerate into a political discussion. This is not about President Obama or Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. This is, a, however, about a philosophy of we what we want to see happen in our society. And at the moment, there's a lot of talk that we have become an entitlement society in which too many people are simply sitting there with their hand out as if all they want to do all day is be given stuff. And I think we forget that there are real people involved, very many people who find themselves in poverty and with hungry children who did nothing to cause that and would do anything they could to get out of that. And at the same time, the Jew has always had this sense that the society as a whole has a responsibility to care for them and we live in a society that has done that very, very well, and yet at the same time not well enough. I don't want to see that process ended. And I am hoping at the moment the sensitivity that you bring, and you talk about that it's, not, it's been bipartisan, it is nonpartisan from your perspective, that basically what you come across in your work as the president and CEO of JCPA are Jews from both sides of, quote, the aisle, all of whom are working as you are to try to alleviate pain wherever possible. Yes, and I, I just want to give you a 30 second commercial uh, of just something we're doing. JCPA and Mazone, which is the. Mazone means food, and it's basically the organization started by Leonard Fine. Years ago, to. Committed to, fighting, make, to fighting hunger. Fighting hunger among all Americans along with the four movements. I mean, this is the first time, we call it with the, with the Reform, the Conservative, the Orthodox, and the Reconstructionist Movement. Rabbis, hundred, over 100 rabbis are so far signed up to take the food stamp challenge. And they're doing it kind of like a race for the cure where people are contributing to their food stamp challenge so that we can use that money to advocate against poverty. But it's, it's, it's community-wide and um, you know, I think it's it's wonderful to watch it. It's exciting to watch the blogs and to watch the work that and, and we've had we've had a lion's share of organizing this, and it's I just want to say that this is the entire, you know, from the from the Orthodox community to the to the Reform community to the Reform community. This is the Jewish world. That's wonderful. So it's it's a nice thing, and I, I, I want to say one more thing, and then I'll stop. I, I, I hate to ever talk so much about and not give everyone credit. I think the American Jewish World Service, which focuses more on world poverty, also does some wonderful work. I, I think we... Ruth Messenger. Ruth Messenger's right. Absolutely. So that's it. Okay, anyway, I want to shake your hand. What a wonderful way for me to start the new year on Shalom TV with you. I don't think there's anybody else I respect more and who is not doing 
extraordinary work of Torah. Everything you do is Torah. And what you're doing for the Jewish world, for the United States of America and the world as a whole, is extraordinary. I wish you called Tuva Hatzlacha. You go from strength to strength to strength, and then you always have to sit with me on Shalom TV, share your insight, your wisdom, and I want you to promise me one day you'll come back. We will not talk about JCPA. I want you to do a drash for me. I want you to teach for me because you also are an extraordinary Jewish teacher, and it would be wonderful for you to share some of your insight in that way on Shalom TV as well. Well, thank you. You, you know, you honor me with your words and your love. Thank you. Thank Shabbat you Shalom. Much. Shabbat Shalom. That is Steve Guto, who is the president and CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, one of the extraordinary good guys on the American Jewish scene. I hope you enjoyed sharing time with him as we begin the new year together. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have. Please email me and write me and I post on our Facebook wall and tweet me. We're everywhere. I need to hear from you. I need feedback to know what are you thinking as you hear the discussions on Shalom TV. Whom would you like to see? What topics would you like us to address? This is your Jewish television network. Shalom TV. Until the next time, I'm Mark Gottlieb. Oh, by the way, a wonderful crew is all around me making this possible. Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, Dara Golub make so much of everything here possible. Oleg and Igor, thank you. And of course to our wonderful producer, Alan Ulrich. Everybody here wants to make Shalom TV everything it can possibly be for you on the American Jewish scene. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Take care. Wonderful.